All right. Hey, good morning, Mercy family. Hey, before we get into this, I want to take a quick second to pray together. And here's what I want to pray about. Uh, this is specifically for our college students. So if you're a college student, I want you to listen up and lock in, okay? The summer that I spent on the mission of God was, and I am not exaggerating, it was my sophomore year. That year between sophomore and junior year, man, that was a life changing, life shaping, life defining moment in my life. All right. I went on something similar to what we have here at Mercy Church called City Project. And there, y'all, the Lord woke me up to what he was doing around the world. Not only that, I got comfortable talking about my faith in a non-Christian environment, in a non-Christian world. Man, and that's what we're going to be doing um, in City Project this summer. And I want to challenge you to go and to be a part of that with us. The deadline's coming up this week. You're going to get worldview training. You're going to get experience locally, nationally, and internationally in ministry. And it's going to be fun. Look, you don't get a lot of chances at this. Uh, and I, what I usually find is around this time where you're deciding whether or not to jump into City Project, there's usually like three hurdles, okay? Three obstacles that I think are actually great opportunities for you to trust the Lord in. The first one usually is like you're thinking about your future, like that summer internship or City Project, right? And you're kind of going back and forth between the two. And let me just encourage you uh, that this summer might actually be the key to your future to show you that you shouldn't sacrifice everything on the altar of career advancement. All right, but instead learn to trust God with your future. I'm not saying internships bad in any way at all. I'm saying learn to trust the Lord with your future. Another one that we hear a lot, I hear a lot is um, money. Like you were planning on going and earning some extra cash this summer. And we're telling you to turn around and raise money so you can come and join us for the summer. Listen, I, you will have plenty of time to make money later, I promise you. All right, um, I'm not, again, not saying the summer job is a bad thing. It's a good thing. But you're also going to have a chance if raising money scares you. Look, y'all, I think of that as a great opportunity because you get to learn to trust the Lord before you ever even get into the summer. And anybody who's been on one of these before will tell you that was where they really saw the Lord provide. The last one, and maybe the biggest one I want to tell you, is um, your relationship with your parents. Um, my folks were really concerned when I went to go jump on City Project and um, it took some conversations and a lot of prayer before talking with them. And I want to challenge you and tell you to, to spend some time praying before you go and talk with them. Really, put that before the Lord. The reason they're hesitant is because they love you, all right? So spend some time putting that before the Lord. And then, then I want you to go and talk with them. And if they still have concerns, I'm going ahead and lay this out right now, all right? I want you to tell them to email me, pastorspence at mercycharlotte.com, all right? Lead pastor of the church. Tell them I will talk with them, let them know what's going on, everything else, try and help um, answer some questions they have. This means that much to me and to our church, all right? We'll make the time and, and let them, we even let them talk with some parents um, here who have had their kids already go on City Project, all right? Um, so let's take a second with all of that said. Um, it is a big decision and I don't want to take that lightly, okay? Even those hurdles you're looking to climb over, I don't take that lightly at all. So I want to pray for you. I want our church to pray together for our college students. It is an honor that the Lord has given us to allow us to be a part of um, walking with college students through this season of life. And I want to pray for them as they're making that decision this week. So will you guys join me as we pray together? Lord, thank you that in your grace and kindness, you've allowed us to walk with young men and women through these college years. It's such a shaping, defining time in their lives. And so we say, thank you. God, I ask for courage, not just courage uh, to make the decision to go on City Project. God, we know that um, you are in charge of everything and that there's not one bad and one good, but instead there's courage to step out and follow you. And God, that's what we're asking for. Would you give our students courage, whatever the decision is, that that courage would come from trusting you and saying, yes, Father, I'm in to whatever you have for me this summer. God, we pray that you would humble them through this time and give them the courage to trust you. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Well, if you got your Bibles, make your way over to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3. We're going to talk today about why we need God's people. All right, we're in our final week of the I'm In series, and we've been, this whole premise of this series was acknowledging that many people view their contribution to God's work in the world the same way they view their contribution to a sporting event, right? For many people, their contribution is the same way. They just come, sit on the sidelines, and cheer on the professionals who are doing the work. And of course, the problem is God didn't create bleachers in his kingdom. 
He's given everybody an ability that's going to bring him glory. And he's calling every single one of us still, whether you've been walking with Christ for five minutes or for 50 years, he's calling every one of us to a next step. So the title of the series is the commitment that we're challenging one another towards to say, God, whatever you are calling me to this year, I'm in. And y'all got to tell you, this has been really encouraging. Several of you have sent me notes just talking through how, as you put this before the Lord, how you've sensed the Lord calling you to a next step of trusting him in whatever area of your life. And you say, look, I'm into the Lord this year. In fact, we're going to give everybody a place where they can share their story so that we can kind of encourage one another in the faith and in what God's doing. We're going to have the, the site's going to be Mercy, or is, it's up now, mercycharlotte.com slash I'm in. It's going to be kind of your one stop for everything on that. But there's a spot in there where you can share, hey, this is what the Lord is, is calling me towards, anonymous or not, doesn't matter, but I'm taking a big step. I'm trusting the Lord and stepping out this year. And we'll talk more even about that later today. But today, as a way to kind of finish out the I'm in series, it's Group Link Sunday. All right, we're launching a bunch of new community groups and we're opening the doors to several more. I'm really excited. Uh, it's pretty cool. A part of this I'm in series, a couple of our community group leaders who are launching new groups said, this is what the Lord's calling me to. I'm leaving my community group. Go launch, um, go launch one. one. In fact, my community group is sending out um, a couple of folks to go and start a new community group. Um, if you're newer to Mercy, community groups are smaller groups of like 12 to 15 folks. They gather in one another's homes on a weekly basis to pray together, to study the Bible together, to encourage one another, just go through life together. Y'all, this year marks my 20th year of being in Christian community and the friends that I've made in those groups, it's, they just had immeasurable impact on my life. And I bet many of you would say the same thing if you've been walking in Christian community for some time. I mean, the guys that were in my community group in college, they were the groomsmen in my wedding. In fact, my first community group leader was also my pastor who was the one who challenged me to go into ministry. The most, my wife's name is Courtney, the most influential woman in her life, her spiritual mother, the relationship, that relationship between her and that woman was formed inside of a community group. When we were deciding whether we were going to be missionary stateside, whether we were going to go into ministry, first off, and then missionary stateside or our missionaries overseas or work in a church, it was in our community group that we prayed and fasted together. When we had kids, and y'all, we had kids like one a year for a while there. It was like the 20, not 20, 2009 model, 2010 model. Um, when we were having those kids, it was our community group who like kept caring for us and bringing us meals and helped us to keep our sanity through that time um, and still do. Uh, many of the weddings that I have performed were friends that we met in community group and we walked them through the dating process with the person they were dating and then got to celebrate with them. When we lost my father-in-law in October, of a couple years ago, it was our community group who not only drove two hours to make sure meals and everything was provided after the service, it was my community group who went into our home and plastered scripture all over our walls and cleaned our home for us. Y'all, it is the space where the people of God have time and time again, have given me encouragement, rebuke, correction, and training, and I'm closer to God because of it. It's where we get beyond our Sunday rows. Our Sunday rows are great, but it's where we get beyond them and into relationships with one another. And if nothing else, y'all, you look at Jesus. He had a great following, but he had 12 guys that he dug into life with. And so if Jesus was in a community group, I'm just saying, if he wasn't too busy for it, then neither should any of us be, all right? So this whole series, we've been in John 13 through 17. So you might be like, if, if you've been with us for this while, why are we jumping over to Hebrews 3, John 13 through 17? In 13, we started in that um, idea of joy, like or that prayer we want to pray every single day in the month of January. Help me to see Jesus first, other second, myself last. And John 15, we looked at abiding in Christ, the vine and the branches metaphor came out that if we're really going to bear fruit, when we say I'm in to God, first we got to receive what God has done for us. And then last week, John 17, we looked at how loving each other really does create that multicultural, multi-generational church. The reason we're moving over to Hebrews 3 is, y'all, I have taught on Christian community for about 15 years. And what I've found is that the calling to step out of rows and into relationships is often met and often processed kind of like the idea of a free app on your phone that also has a paid version, all right? And so you get the free app, 
right? And you're like, man, the free app's good. And then you see the ad and it's like, hey, for $3.99, this thing is going to be amazing. And you kind of go, yeah, no. You know, if you're like me anyways, now there's nothing that I've ever paid for app-wise on my phone. And people hear the call from scripture to step out of Sunday rows and into community where you are known and where you know others. And you consider it as kind of a, that's a nice optional upgrade to my involvement in church, but I'm okay version. And Hebrews 3 is going to just flip that mindset on its head, saying not only is it not optional, actively belonging to and participating in Christian community is critical, critical. It says you are in great danger without it. And it does all of that in about four verses, all right? So I'm going to read you these four verses. Hebrews 3, we're going to be in um, verses 12 through 15. Y'all, this has been one of the uh, most life-shaping passages of Scripture to me, personally. I was a community group's pastor for 10 years before coming to launch Mercy Church. This is um, deep within me. The Lord has done a big work in me and showing me how powerful and important and critical community is, and we're going to see it from this passage. So I'm going to read it, and then we'll dig into it. Here we go. You ready? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> well, it's coming. Ready or not? Here we go. Verse 12. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage each other daily while it is still called today, so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. For we have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly until the end, the reality that we had at the start. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. What this passage, this short passage is saying is that you may not sense it day in and day out, but there is a war going on in your heart. The decision to follow God or to follow your own evil desires, and it's a war that God's people are always in because the vestiges of sin remains in our hearts, even though we have the presence of God with us. And the answer, the key to winning, to having victory in these battles is apparently other Christians. So let's look closer at this passage and see how he gets there. I just want to walk back through it. Now that I've read it once for you, I want to walk slowly back through it. You look at verse 12, he starts out with this, watch out, right? Watch out. He doesn't say, Carry on casually about your day, brothers and sisters, and you'll be fine. No, he's sounding an alarm for Christians because there's no such thing as passive Christianity where you just pray a prayer when you're eight and then you don't engage God anymore. If we're walking on the sidewalk and I yell at you, watch out, you don't say, hmm, that's good, Spence, amen. <laughs> no, you duck and cover, right? Action. That's what he's calling us to. Active defense against a natural inclination our hearts have that will lead us to a space of unbelief. Like left on our own, we'll drift. Our hearts are like a car with its wheel out of alignment. Unless we grab hold of it left to itself, it will drift into the ditch of unbelief. That's what he's telling us. In fact, his warning is it's building on the example of how God's people in the Bible did this very thing. If you notice in your Bible right before verse 12, if you look up, there's this section that looks like poetry. It's, it's shaped a little bit different. Now, this is cool. You know, I'm always telling you the Bible is really cool, right? Here's what's happening. Okay, Hebrews. So people told me that we would get lost if I tried to show you this connection. So I'm gonna try and show it to you and you're not gonna get lost. And then I'm gonna get to go back and go, ha, to the people that told me not to do this, okay? So let's work together just for my own pride. I'll deal with that later, all right? Anyways, so look. <laughs> Hebrews 3, what's happening right there, right before verse 12, and it's actually also in 15, it's quoting Psalm 95. What Psalm 95 is, Psalm 95 is a commentary on an event that happened over in Numbers 14 with the people of Israel. Everybody with me? Quoting Psalm 95, Psalm 95, commentary on Numbers 14, all right? Now, Numbers 14 Israel is about to finally get into the promised land. They're walking around, finally going to get into the promised land. God brought his people out of slavery from Egypt, was bringing them to the land. He'd promised them to a land of 
rest. Maybe you know the story of why they were out in the wilderness. Before that, they had been brought out of Egypt through this crazy series of events, the plagues where they had gnats and flies infestations, hailstorms, dead cattle, darkness, like a horror movie version of Waxhaw just happening right there day in, day out. And then finally they get, they get relieved, right? It's the Exodus. He brings his people out, does some unbelievable, unforgettable stuff all to get them to the promised land. And they're about to enter. They're finally about to go in and they send out 10 spies to go and check out the land. And the spies come back and eight out of the 10 say, guys, we got a huge problem, a really huge problem. The people in that land we're supposed to go into and take over, they are tall. Like NCAA, mid-major D1 tall, not NBA tall, but they're, they're tall. And we are a bunch of short guys. But two of the guys, Joshua and Caleb, no, no, they're ready to go in. Tall people don't threaten them because they know that God is with them. They're my Old Testament heroes. Here's why. My dad is 6'2", one brother is 6'3", the other brother is 6'5", okay? So at a mighty 5'9", I read that and I'm like, I see you, Josh, I see you, Caleb, I'm with you, right? We know how it is. Holy Spirit's gonna tell us when to sweep the leg, those guys are gonna fall, right? <laughs> But the other eight and the rest of Israel, no, they don't believe God will see them through. So they revolt. They demand new leadership. They grumble against God. And God says to Moses, how long? How long are they not going to believe in me? He even calls them evil in Numbers 14 because of their unbelief. The only time, the whole first five books of the Bible, that God calls his people evil are right there in that spot. And as a result, he banishes that generation from coming into the promised land because they had hardened their hearts. That's the language in Numbers 14. That's the language in Psalm 95. That's the language over here in Hebrews 3. They had hardened their hearts against God. Psalm 95 says, don't be like them. Now our author here in Hebrews 3 is making the same point. The people, think about this guys, the people that God brought out of Israel with a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night, they ended up missing what God had for them because of their own unbelief. As if to say, and what Hebrews is saying is, if anyone should have had no trouble believing God at his word, it would have been his people, Israel. And if they fell, anyone can. So watch out. What our author is doing, he's warning us against going down that same road because, verse 13, sin is deceitful. You don't know that your heart is hardening, that you're developing a pattern that will lead to unbelief. You don't know it. And what keeps you from falling away from the living God? His people. His people are the mouthpiece of his promises that he's given to us. And every single one of us, if we don't have those people encouraging us, we become susceptible to the attack of the enemy. Since we're talking about this like warfare, think of it like a group of soldiers. You know, before modern warfare, the ancient Greeks and the Romans, they had that formation called the phalanx, right? Where you stood shoulder to shoulder, you locked your shields together. The second row put their shields over top, right? You've probably seen it in the movie Gladiator or something like that. You were shielded not just by your shield, but a shield on each side and a shield over the top. That's the people of God shielding you from the arrows of the enemy on every side, saying, watch out. And listen, I hope you hear a pastor's heart here. You know who I see the enemy preying on, and there is an enemy in this war. You know who I fear for in our midst? It's those who are in isolation. I see it all the time. Those who drift away from community, who find themselves in isolation. They're not really known by anybody. They don't really know anybody. They are the soldier who has drifted out of the phalanx, phalanx and is now susceptible to the enemy. That's what sin does. It tries to isolate you. When verse 12 says that an evil, unbelieving heart will lead you to fall away from the living God, that's how. You get comfortable with sin, and when you get comfortable with sin, happens every time. You get uncomfortable with the people of God. So you move, you move yourself away from God and his people. You might even find yourself, listen, a little numb to the voice of God. Had a guy tell me once, sitting in my office, it just said it, it, it stuck with me. I've had people say it several times, but it was so honest and I really appreciated that. 
He said, honestly, I just don't feel like there are any consequences to my sin. I don't really feel bad when I sin anymore. That's the hardening of your heart to the deceitfulness of sin. Sin wants to keep you alone. It wants to keep you in secret. One of my favorite um, pastors, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, said in his book, um, here's what he said of sin. The book is called Life Together, an incredible little read that I would wholeheartedly recommend. Here's what he said. He said, sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him. And the more deeply he becomes involved in it, the more disastrous is his isolation. Sin wants to remain unknown. It shuns the light. In the darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole being of a person. And this can happen, this last, this is haunting, even in the midst of a pious community. What are we to do then? Satan, with his deception as his weapon, is prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. What are we to do? The answer that he gives is encourage one another. That's verse 13. Encourage each other. How often? Let's group participation here. Encourage each other. Daily. Daily. Well, it's still called today. That none of you is hardened by sin's deception. The prescription God gives to keep us from being hardened by deception is the people of God. This is the way I want to say it. God uses his people to guard us from sin's deception. That is the thing I want you to really take home, and I want that to be on your mind, and this passage on your mind as you consider your step into community and maybe even further into community. It's the whole point of verse 13. Another way to say it, you and I, we have blind spots. Y'all remember Israel? had the presence of God with them, and yet they were deceived by sin. They had massive blind spots. So do I, so do you. Many people I know react to the idea of opening up and being in community with, well, really, what am I going to get out of that? They're not counselors. They're not pastors. What credentials do those people have, other church people have, that I would let them into my life? I'll tell you their credentials. They're not you. And there's a lot that any not you can see about you that you can't see about you. You want proof? <laughs> you ever um, heard your voice recorded and played back to you? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> as part of my work, I have to watch game film of myself, okay? So I don't wanna, you, you've heard that, right? And the first thing you think is, that doesn't sound like me. And everybody says, yes, it does sound like you. You want more proof? You remember those first seasons of American Idol, the TV show? The first episodes were gold. I mean, just gold. Why? Because person after person comes through and we all cringe and laugh because they think they have talent and everyone else, millions of people, all know that they are completely blind to their own shortcomings, right? Y'all, here's the deal. I know, and I know to the point that it does trouble, it really does trouble me that somebody here this weekend is being fooled by sin and you are starting to be hardened in your heart towards it or towards God. God is becoming less and less attractive to you. Apathy is reigning in your spiritual life. Maybe you've already taken steps to isolate yourself. I want you to hear, just hear God's word in verse 15, if that's you. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the days of the rebellion. Today, Today, turn from the direction where you were heading and tell God, okay, God, I'm in, God. Y'all, when I preach, what I pray is that the Spirit of God would illuminate your heart and your mind in such a way that everything else kind of goes away and you're, the eyes of your hearts are lifted up and you're just directly responding to God himself. And I pray that you wake up to the reality of sin and to the reality of grace and return to the God who loves you. I've watched too many men my age leave their families because some time ago they got mad about something that happened in their life. And instead of dealing with that anger through the grace and love of Jesus, they let it fester. And then two years later they leave. And we all go into crisis mode. Like, where did this come from? 
But the truth is, sin had deceived them and had been hardening their hearts for years. And I'm no better. That's why I'm so insanely adamant about being an open book. Because just like those guys, I don't want to wake up ever and say, you know what? I don't love my wife. I hate God. I'm done. I don't want that. And the only way I don't end up there is according to Hebrews 3, it's confession inside of community where every single day a brother or sister in Christ can look at me and say, Christ is better. Christ is better. Remember the promises of God with you. Remember the cross. Remember the empty tomb. Remember his presence is with you now. Remember that suffering is going to produce perseverance and perseverance is going to one day produce hope. Remember now, remember that one day you will be with God and all of this present suffering will be over. Remember the promises of God. Christ is better. I need that and so do you. Sin's deception leads to prideful isolation the gospel produces humility inside of community. And here in community, we find breakthrough after breakthrough into deeper fellowship with Christ as brothers and sisters shepherd us with the gospel. Now, what does that look like? Very practically, what we see here in this passage is it means you need to deputize some people to go hunting for sin in your life. You need to commit to them that you will leave your life completely open to them and they need to commit to be as honest as necessary to point out the sin in your life. And the kicker is you got to commit to do the same for them. It's mutual, all right? You, you need a head start. Uh, maybe you have that person identified, although I think for many of us, it's walking out of here and saying, okay, who's going to be my sparring partner? Who's going to be my hunting partner? I don't know that sounds a little, but you know what I mean? Like who's going to be the one that I really get into this with and get real with so that I'm not the person who's in a quote unquote pious community, but still wandering away from God. Maybe it's just the simple three questions that you ask and somebody asks you, where are you right now? And why are you there? What's going on down there? Where are you? Why are you there? What's the next step God's calling you to? And I want to hold you to that. You can be in a community group, by the way. I told you this series is about something much deeper than a church programming. It's what goes on in the heart. And that's because you can be in all the programs you want to be in, and this still not happen. So to community group members who are already there, true community requires intentionality. Do not assume that your attendance means you're there. Talk about it and get that and get there. And I want to, I actually want to show you the second half, that quote that I gave you from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. There's a second half to it that I want to share with you now that I think um, really shows you the power of confession in community. He says, when you confess your sin to another Christian, the expressed acknowledged sin has lost all its power. He is no longer alone with his evil for he has cast off his sin in confession and now handed it over to God. It's been taken away from him. Now he stands in the fellowship of sinners who live by the grace of God in the cross of Jesus Christ. Now he can't list, Now he can be a sinner, right? You're never going to get to that spot where you don't ever sin anymore. But now you can be a sinner and still enjoy the grace of God. He can confess his sins and in this very act, find fellowship for the first time. The sin concealed separated him from the fellowship and it made all his apparent fellowship a sham. This dude is writing in the 30s in Germany, and I swear it feels like he was writing in 2020 Bible Belt land. The sin concealed separated him from the fellowship, made all his apparent fellowship a sham. The sin confessed has now helped him to find true fellowship with the brethren in Jesus Christ. Do you have that kind of fellowship with anyone? Someone to sit down with face to face and inspect your life, to watch your mannerisms, to watch you when you're with other people, to see how you respond, to put a hand on your shoulder and pray the promises of scripture over you as you finally rip off the mask and reveal the ugly in your life. If that scares you, listen, if that scares you, you don't want any of that. Maybe you've been deceived by sin. And you've been deceived this way about who God really is and who your brother or sister really is. So I, I confess, if, if you're thinking, yeah, I need to confess to God, but nobody else needs to know, that right there is sin deceiving you. All right? God says that God is the holy, righteous judge, the one without fault, and that all men and women are sinners. 
But sin is deceitful, and what it does is it switches those in our eyes. All right, so when I talk about confessing, you think, no, what will other people think about me? Who cares? What they should think is, me too, because they're sinners just like you. It should sober you, though, to repent to a holy, excuse me, to a holy God who is just and righteous. So if you think, I'm just going to confess to God and not to others, you're being deceived. You're really just confessing to yourself and some false version of God that you've created. That's one of the reasons you're stuck in a cycle with whatever sin you're battling. Don't buy sin's deception. I don't think that means you shout it that we're just going to all on the count of three, shout out our deepest, darkest sins in here, okay? I think it means you find that community that you go deep with, that person that can have a hunting license in your life. Listen, the last stronghold Satan has on your life is the lack of confession of sin. Community. That's what God, the way he has wired this world up, is the gospel community, the community of the gospel, the community in a minute that's going to gather around the communion table, whose identity, who's been bound together by what Christ has done, who stays together through the Holy Spirit, tying us together. That community brings the gospel to one another, verbalizes the gospel. You've heard me say there's a, a word that we need to make up and use and implement, and that's gospeling one another. And in doing so, we break through sin's deception. And in that moment, you're finally known for who you really are. And you experience love instead of condemnation. That right there is where you don't just hear the gospel, you experience it. It feeds your soul like a vine feeds the branch. And that's what verse 14 says. We have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly until the end the reality we had at the start. When you and I are daily encouraging one another with the gospel, daily reminding each other that Christ is better, we start to see fruit, start to see evidences of God's faithfulness in one another's lives. And what that will do when we are that close to one another and we're with one another for a while, it'll start to stir up even more belief in us because we're participating in Christ as we hold firmly the standing that Christ's death and resurrection gave us as sons and daughters. This series I'm in began with the idea too many of us sit on the sidelines when it comes to God and his purposes for our lives. We don't use our gifts, maybe because we don't know what they are. We treat our, our faith like spectators watching a game. And I'm in is not just the title of the series. It is the commitment that God is calling us to make. And it's a commitment we need to make to one another. God has never done calling us to trust him. There's a step that he's calling each one of us to take. And I want to ask you, what is that step he's calling you to take? For many of you, that's community group. I've told you we are a young church. A four-year-old church means that there's moments like these. Uh, one of my biggest concerns right now is about 50, a little over 50% of you, a little over half of you right now are in church on a Sunday, but not actively engaged in community. And I want to call you, not out of a, you need to get into a program, but to say, this is not some upgrade, some extra add-on, but it's absolutely central and vital to your walk with God. And it's time to get, all, get off the sidelines and on the team. So I want you to go, I want you to visit group link today and, and get into a group. Yes, it is awkward to make new friends, okay? I recognize the introverts in the room right now are just really having a moment, okay? I, I get it. But I'm telling you that this awkward moment, this difficult moment is worth it. It is worth it to be in community with others. Now, maybe I'm in is something else for you. We built, built that page on our website for you to be able to respond and, and share, okay, this is what I'm in. I want to know because our pastors, our elders, our prayer team is going to take that list and is going to be praying for you in the months to come as you step out and you trust God. And as, as it relates to other things, there's different things you can do on that page as well. And we put those there because we believe that God calls every believer to step out in some way, to take a next step. Trusting that when you say, okay, God, I'm in, he's gonna provide whatever that is, whether it's related to the church or not at all, whatever that step God is calling you to, write it down. Write it down on that page, write it down in your journal, write it down somewhere because there's something about writing it down that gives it power, that moves it from a fleeting thought 
And again, we want to pray for you on it. Last weekend, there were about 10 people at our church who said they were placing their faith in Christ for the first time. That's the most important I'm in commitment that you can make to say, okay, God, I've been teetering on the edge. I've been kind of flirting with church, flirting with this idea of trusting you, but, but I've been kind of hedging. I'm not really, wasn't really ready. Maybe today you join them and say, yes, okay, God, I'm in. I believe. Because everything else you're going to do in the Christian faith, the strength for that comes from resting in what God did for you. The gospel says Jesus looked at the lostness and the sinfulness of mankind, and he said, I'm in. When it meant leaving heaven, he said, I'm in. When it meant going to the cross to sacrifice his life for your sins and mine, Jesus still said, I'm in. I was thinking about this today, though. When he got out of the grave, I would love to be able to say, he said, I'm out, you know, because that has been a pretty cool, cool thing and great preaching moment. <laughs> Y'all, when the first disciples were called and it cost them their whole life, he, called, he said, come, give me your whole life because my way is better. They said, I'm in. Even when it meant going to their death for him. Every follower of Christ begins their journey with him by saying, I see what you did, God. I believe you did it for me. You're asking me for my whole life in response to that, and I'm in. Maybe that's the step you need to take. Next week, you need to come and be baptized. It's the first step of obedience Christ calls his followers to make. His death was public. Dying for you was not a secret thing he did, nor should receiving his grace be. It should be a celebration as an act of obedience, a way of publicly saying, I'm in. Come talk to us after the service about that. I'm praying, y'all, I am praying that God moves mightily among Mercy Church over the course of this year. But I'm praying that it's in each one of us saying, okay, God, whatever that step is you have for me, I'm in, I'm in. We're gonna take communion together as a way to respond to the word of God together coming to the table with the thing that the Lord has given us to remember, to remember that he came for us and that we are in together in the body of Christ. So I wanna pray for you and then our teams are gonna come and, and lead us in taking communion. But will you join me and let's pray together. I wanna to actually give you a chance to respond to the Lord. I wanna walk you through that time. So if you would, bow your heads, close your eyes, both of our campuses. The whole series has been pointing to a moment where you get before the Lord, a moment that leads to a regular everyday practice of saying, okay, God, I'm in. So would you, before the Lord, and we do this from time to time, maybe you need to take the physical posture of your hands, not clenched closed, but instead open before him to say, okay, God, here's my life. Just that posture represents that. And would you say to him, I'm yours, I'm in. All I have is yours. God, give me the courage to take the next step. Maybe that next step is gonna be you going first and repairing a relationship. You're gonna trust the strength of God. You're gonna abide in the vine and trust him. Maybe that next step is gonna be stepping out and getting into community and that scares you, you're nervous about that. You got baggage and you're gonna trust God and say, okay, God, I know I need it, so I'm in. Whatever it is, maybe today you say, I have never given my life to Christ. I've been around church. I've been an attender, but I've never said, okay, God, I'm in. I believe what you did was for me. I'm turning from my sin. I'm receiving what you did for me. I'm in. You tell him that now. God, I pray for courage. Just like we prayed for our college students, I pray for courage for all of us. Help us, Father. Help us to humble ourselves. Would you break through the pride, the walls that pride builds up in us? Help us to humble ourselves and trust you. Would the Spirit provide courage and joy in taking steps of trusting you? 
You continue to pray and then our teams will come and lead us.